uh, evening. We are very happy of having all of you here. I want to show before the official opening by our Dean uh, Michelle, the past, I want to show you uh, one video that Ali Salazar, that is a young lady, 17, that is there. She said, well, let's have something and some idea from children, from young people, thinking about what you are doing, what the rights, the equity. And we said, well, it's a great thing, but it's not very easy to do that. No? Well, for me. And she said, no, 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 I can do it. So let me show this, what I, I don't even Definitely know how to show it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start with that because really it was a uh, I don't believe that an education's worth should be defined on a person's socioeconomic background because depending on how much money children have for their families, that affects what education they receive and that essentially deprives them of opportunities which they could have in their futures. So in my ideal world, I think every child should have an opportunity to at least have a secondary education. If they don't have access to that education, they, the children are exploited and they have to work hours that a normal child should not have to work. I think in our society we take it for granted having all these things that are as simple as social security numbers and accessible health care and uh, being able to work. In my ideal world, the government would recognize this large group of people that everyone seems to forget about and help them get social security numbers, help them get health care so that they can help themselves and support themselves so the cycles can keep happening all over the world. Child abuse is something that is one of the worst things that could happen in this world. I mean, it's a very shameful topic. You're kind of just destroying all these futures for these children that could potentially grow up to do something so much better. In my ideal world, every child should um, be given the love and the support and the care that they need to thrive in the future so that we can only go onward from here and make the world a better place. Um, I think a balance has to be struck between giving children a voice and maybe not because on one hand they are going to inherit the earth once the older people are gone but they may not be as experienced as adults. But I definitely think there is a bias that adults might not take children or kids or even people our age um, as seriously. And I think that should change because, again, we are going to inherit the world. So we should have a say in how it's shaped. In an ideal world, of course, everyone should get their say. Um, but that's difficult because, obviously, very young children might not be aware of all of the issues um, that are facing them. I think definitely maybe reduce the voting age a little or something like that. I think it's a social problem, so I think we just have to ask adults to change their mentality of how they see kids, because we do see nowadays that kids are making a difference, like Malala for example, so I think they should just take our ideas and our input into account. So.
Thank you, please. Peter. Thank you. We do the hard work. Thank you for giving me the honor of opening up this evening's events. Um, I think it's important for me to start out by letting you know that I'm the mother of a two-year-old, Alexander DePass Paulson, and he uh, is my lord and master. <laughs> and as we uh, have a conversation tonight about equity for children and the rights of children, I always think about my dear Alexander, and I am very lucky, he's very lucky, that I can support and protect his rights. But there are a lot of children that don't have an adult that can help them do that. So this is what this evening is about. And I have the honor of welcoming you on behalf of not only the New School, but also the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy. I'm Michelle DePass, I'm the Dean of the Milano School. Uh, my one year anniversary is actually this week, so I am no longer a rookie. And <laughs> so um, thank you for allowing me to open up this evening's stimulating event and program. Uh, I also just have to ad lib for a second in that I uh, live in New Jersey and I drive to Newark every day and I listen to the BBC every morning. And um, this morning there was a story uh, on a reporter was there in the heart of Sierra Leone where there was no medical help, but the reporter was there and the story was on the burials that were happening in the community. And he walked across the street and there were 23 children across the street who thought that they were far enough away to protect themselves and he asked how many of you have been orphaned uh, you know recently through Ebola and every child raised their hands and he said several of them look feverish and it was very frustrating that we were hearing this from a reporter the reporter can get there but the facility that can protect the right to proper care cannot uh, and I'm not talking about a specific facility, I just mean in general, what we need to be able to protect that right. And so I thank you all for the work that you're doing here. Um, at the New School, we do share a lifelong commitment to be able to educate the next generation and leaders in urban policy and international affairs and management, and several of those future leaders are here in the room. We're committed to our students, and I hope that you have an opportunity to engage with some of them this evening. Our partners tonight, Equity for Children, Young Lives of the University of Oxford, UNICEF, UNDP, and Communilife are also very dedicated to strengthening the policies and programs for children that are living in poverty. And I've been learning that they do that through several lenses. The first is through evidence, gathered through dedicated research over time. The second is an international focus. The third is urban issues faced in the 21st century. And the fourth is diversity. And with us, we have experts in the field. We have Young Lives, the University of Oxford program, whose longitudinal study of childhood poverty adds substantially to our knowledge about children and how they grow from birth to 15. UNICEF and UNDP colleagues, of whom I met several outside before this evening, push us to ask the right questions about what it's like to grow up in unequal societies, how the century can be better to serve children living in poverty, to ensure the fulfillment of their rights. Communal life offering insights about New York City and their children and their families who are underserved, and how to think about housing and community development to assist those with unrealized rights. We are proud to serve as a convener for tonight's conversation, especially on the 21st anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So thank you for allowing us to do that. Just like everyone here in the room tonight, my own work in this area is based upon deep beliefs in equity. That's what I do. That's what I live. And 
the inequities still persist, even though all of us in the room are committed to it and dedicated to it. Despite progress in the areas such, child, such as child survival and nutrition, children worldwide are still disproportionately affected by poverty and inequality, and that's a shame. The nation's communities are changing. Demographic, economic, and political realities are shifting. Yet race and class-based inequality continues to rise. The paradigm shift towards greater inequality in the US began in the mid-1970s. But I still believe that public policy can and must serve as a vehicle to reverse the trend towards inequality and instead help advance economic and social inclusion. Tonight is a great example of what we do here at the New School and what we can all achieve together. We are working with you to provide access to the leading thinkers and advocates who are working to build a more inclusive and just society through public policy. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Alberto Minyahin, who I've learned a lot from since I've been here in this past year. Thank you. <laughs> and pupil to your teacher. Alberto started Equity for Children here at the New School in 2006. 30 years ago, he began advocacy for child rights. 30 years ago. And few people were thinking at that time about equity for children. Now the world is catching up, but we still have our, our leader, leading thinker here with us, and we're very proud of him. Alberto's multi-decade international expertise in the area of child rights and social policy through lectures, books, evidence-based research, teaching, I can go on and on, but it's all made him a pioneer in the field. He and his team are working tirelessly on these issues. So I enjoy tonight's conversation and program, and I give you, again, Alberta. Thank you. Well, um, Thank you very much, Michelle, for this. I want to thank also Michael Cohen, that is the Director of International Affairs. I want to thank Genei Salazar, that is yes. here. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, the Deputy Director of Equity for Children, but she was working on all this, the full team and the volunteers that are working here, and especially the Young Life colleague that came from Oxford, and uh, two days ago, so they are ready for the presentation today. And uh, let me say a few words. Uh, with Young Life, we have a long-term relation and collaboration. Um, I think that two or three years ago, we present here, we had a great presentation of the third round of the results, and a very good debate, and we, all the time we are in contact and trying to doing and thinking on doing new things, no? And basically, the, the concern that we share is they are producing incredible evidence no? about what is going on with the life of children. They are following 12,000 uh, uh, kids uh, in developing countries. Is for me, is one of the most important research that are around the world. But the question all the time is how we will change the life of family and children with this. How we promote. So this evidence that we, we will see today um, will give space for this conversation. And uh, today event we frame also as part of the 25th anniversary of the Convention of the Right of the Child. It's 25 years, it's a long term, and it's nothing. There is a tango that says 30 years is nothing. No? Uh, but uh, a lot of good things happen. We, need, we have a lot of things to celebrate with the Convention of the Right of the Child because many, many good things happen, and we can see changes in many of the countries, and that's uh, the, the point of celebration. However, 
we are, at the same time, we are seeing the situation of poverty, inequality, what is going on, what Michel was saying about the, the kids in uh, Ebola and that orphan. We were talking with the UNICEF people. They are estimated at 8,000 or 7,000, and the estimation for the next year is, I don't know how many more. So there is a lot of things that are going on, and we need to change around the world. That's the first thing that we need to be aware of. And the second thing is that uh, probably in some moment we need to review the Convention of the Right of the Child. It's a new century, new things are happening around the world. The corporations are so strong around the world that we need to ask for things for the corporation. There is, I want to say, a very close friend that some of the people here know, Eduardo Bustelo. He was uh, part of UNICEF and he was a big promoter of the Convention of the Right of a Child and we worked together on that. In the last five years we were discussing and he was saying we need to change things, there are new things now going around. So let's be aware of that and uh, we want to celebrate but we want more. That's the point. No? So today objective. Uh, we have two objectives. First, we will see the evidence, and uh, my idea is that it's a learning moment for all of us, especially for me. But uh, we will have a conversation between us. That's the idea that I have in mind. And conversation on what? On policies. What is the best thing that we can do for changing and improving the situation? The second thing that is the objective of today is an advocacy thing. It's not that, I don't think that we are trying to advocate between us, because many of us are very convinced of all this. The point, and that's what I want to convey all of you, is to take this discussion to the action that you are doing and the thing that you are doing every day, and to take your organization and the message that, that are coming from here and to promote the thing that we will be discussing. So we will have uh, now how we will do today. We will have two brief presentations from our friends from Young Life. Uh, and after that, a panel that uh, will discuss two questions, basically. Two motivate the debate about among us. And after that, we will have a conversation. So I want to pass the floor to Jan Life. Uh, I think that Jeannie will start. So Jeannie Morrow. No. <laughs> uh, she's the deputy director of uh, Young Life with a long experience on, uh, on children's issues and uh, childhood ethics and method of research. Yeah? I'm not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, and um, she has a master in sociology of childhood and children's rights at the Institute of Education. Oh, and I, I, I ran the course. You ran the course. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You ran the course. You, you, you ran the course. Yeah, That's exactly. Okay. okay, so I give the floor to her. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And after yeah. that, I, let me introduce also Paul Dorman, the senior policy officer of Young Life. And uh, his work is to look at the research and to see how to translate research into policies. Not an easy task. Okay. So okay, thank you so much, Alberto, and it's such a privilege to be here and to actually to have such a big audience, and it's, I hope that I will speak clearly and not too quickly. I do have a tendency to speak very fast. So it really, for me, as someone who taught uh, a master's program on, on the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child for seven years, it's, it was such a pleasure for me to see that the, the context for the presentation that I'm giving is the 25th anniversary. And um, I think I just want to repeat some of the things that have already been said. 
this is from the UN General Assembly report of the Secretary General on the status of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. We celebrating or, or, or commenting on the, the status of the UNCRC, we've seen huge progress achieved through a holistic approach to child development. Child survival and enrollment rates in school have gone up massively. But as everybody has said in the context for this presentation, widespread iniqui inequities are affecting the poorest and most vulnerable children. And this is a global issue. It's not just a question, a question for low-income countries. It's a question for all countries. The report take, talks about an unfinished agenda, and it also focuses on and emphasizes the importance of child protection, which links quite nicely to the film that was made by the young people at the beginning of this. And of course, the context for this is, as has been pointed out recently um, in the World Bank report, is that 47% of all people living in extreme poverty are aged 18 years or younger. I mean, so this is a huge question that, that needs to be addressed. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm conscious of the time, so remind me if I go on for more than about 10, okay? Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Young Lives, our research study. Um, it's a multidisciplinary study that aims to improve the understanding of childhood poverty. It aims to provide evidence, as Alberto has generously said, to improve policies and practices in low-income countries. We're following nearly 12,000 children in four countries, and the countries are Ethiopia, the, the state of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana in India, that that state was formerly Andhra Pradesh and bifurcated in June this year, Peru and Vietnam, and we're following the children over 15 years. So we've now covered an 11-year period. The first data were collected in 2002, and we're reporting, as Albert, Alberto has said, on the fourth round of our survey. We also have included four waves of qualitative research with a small uh, sample, nested sample, of 50 of the Young Lives children uh, in each country. And because one of the early findings from Young Lives was worrying indications that schools were not improving children's learning, we added a component that did research in the Young Lives Children's Schools. So as Alberto has also said, we cover two age co cohorts of children in each country. 2,000 children born in around two, 2000 to 2001, they're the main uh, part of the study, and 1,000 children who were born in about 1994 to 95. But they're now about 20. They're the, they're, we call them the older cohort, and they were only actually included as a pilot but we've managed to hold on to them throughout the course of the research. And of course, this older cohort are absolutely fascinating right now because they've been making transitions into, into adult, adulthood around this time. Young Lives is a pro-poor sample, so we sample from 20 sites in each country, reflecting country diversity, rural, urban, and diverse livelihoods and ethnicities. It's not actually a representative sample. This is quite common in cohort studies. And it's a collaboration between the University of Oxford and partners in each study country who could gather the data and we, who we've managed to work with over the whole period of the study. Now, the study was actually commissioned by the UK Department for International Development, who, and I say this, I said this last night at the seminar in CUNY, if anyone can remember the turn of the millennium, there was a huge wave of optimism. And um, the UK government wanted to to track the progress of the Millennium Development Goals. It's hard to remember that wave of optimism now, but, <laughs> but, but it was a visionary thing to do. I mean, to commission a study in four countries all at once over this period um, was pretty ambitious. But we've also received funding from the Dutch Government International Section to do the school study and Irish aid. And we're undertaking various collaborations, including with the, the UNICEF Office of Research in, in, um, in Florence. So that's the study, and this is a way to visualize our research. So I don't know if you can see, but I'm, at this point I ooh, need a pointer really, but here we are in 2014 now. We're just at this very moment completing the uh, qualitative data gathering in Andhra Pradesh, um, and um, we'll finish the study with uh, following the children. Well, I say, should we finish the study? I don't think so, because to, to, to stop um, with the younger cohort when they're 15 seems like now a very unfinished story to tell. So it would be a shame to stop. 
The older cohort will be 22 when we do the final round of the survey in 2016. So lots of potential there. So what have we seen in 10 years of children's lives? So this is, that we've seen the, econ the economies of all four Young Lives countries grow very rapidly in the first decade of the 21st century. And this growth has been accom accompanied by infrastructural improvements, increased service access associated with the MDGs. So we've seen increased, ex increased external investment, road and communications infrastructure. We've seen primary school enrollment go, go become near universal across the sample in three of our countries and it's rapidly increasing in Ethiopia. We've seen the rollout of social protection schemes focused on poor families, the Mahatma Gandhi uh, National Rural, Rural Employment Guarantee Act in, in uh, India, for example, in Peru, the conditional cash transfer scheme, Juntos, and in Ethiopia, another employment scheme that helps poor families. We've seen health insurance in Vietnam and Peru and in India and in Ethiopia, the rollout of health extension workers. And the, the, the table down the side gives you an example of Peru, where we've seen increase in internet access, electricity, flush toilets, sanitation, and piped water. So the, these are good news stories. Um, and if we look at what's happened to the young people at the age of 19, we can see that actually impressive numbers are continuing in studying, uh, sometimes combining study and work. Large numbers are working only, and um, we also have gender disparities in who is, no, who is not working, and I'll come on to explain why that is in, in the United Andhra Pradesh, Pradesh sample. But basically, as I say, substantial numbers are still studying 19, but what we find is that the, it's, the, it's the least poor young people, those whose parents had higher levels of education, and those growing up in urban areas who are staying longer in education. We see gender differences in three out of four countries uh, by, by the age of 19 in WHO studies. Young men are much more likely to remain studying in Andhra Pradesh, India, and young women in Ethiopia and Vietnam. And we find that poorer young women and those living in rural areas are more likely to be married and to have given birth. So these are the percentages of our uh, young women in the older cohort. And we see the higher levels in um, Andhra Pradesh, India, and perhaps surprisingly lower levels in Ethiopia that one might have anticipated. Uh, it, we have to be a bit cautious about that because it could be to do with where our actual, where our samples are. And we, but when we, when we look at birth rates, uh, we find that there are high, quite high levels of um, young women who've given birth in Peru and in Andhra Pradesh, India, um, unsurprisingly in India because of the high levels of marriage, and, and lower levels in Vietnam and again in Ethiopia. So one could say that it, it could be, uh, there's been a huge policy push on early marriage in Ethiopia and other countries, and it's perhaps because of that that we're seeing these lower rates um, that we might have expected. So I'm now going to hand over to Paul, who's going to talk about the key questions for policy. Uh, thank you, Ginny. And just also to say thank you very much for, for attending today, for, for Equity for Children and for the other um, organisers. As Ginny says, it's a real privilege um, uh, to be here um, tonight, and we've appreciated the long run relationship that uh, Alberto mentioned, um, and um, uh, I, I'm very glad to be considering it, uh, to be continuing it. So Ginny's um, given us a bit of a starter in terms of the nature of the Young Lives uh, study, and the particular question about a longitudinal study which looks at the same individuals over time and what might be going on in their lives, which offers us some particular advantages in trying to understand how earlier circumstances in life might pay off later in terms of children's um, development. I wanted to move us on a little bit by talking a little bit about some first some key questions for policy and then to wind back a little bit earlier in, in, in young people's lives. Um, uh, Ginny has started by, by looking at kind of the outcomes at, 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 um, at 19 for the older cohort, but a life stage, a life course approach to understanding children and young people's development looks at what might have shaped that um, earlier. So I want to address the question of, of thinking about why we see large differences um, at, at by 19. 
And I suppose as part of that, the question becomes a policy one that Alberto raised to start off with. What sorts of approaches might um, improve equality of opportunity and stop young people being left behind? Language that's coming through with the debates around the sustainable development goal. And just to reflect on the video that we all saw at the start, it was really nice to see that for a number of reasons. It was nice to hear that um, from uh, of, of young people growing up in the United States, to see the commonalities of the experiences that they were recounting and many of the things that we'll be talking about here with children growing up in, 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 in uh, lower and middle income countries. But one thing that I suppose I noticed when I, I, I listened to that was the focus on education, the focus on a sense of education as something that could be life changing. And that's a, a, a sense that we see coming very strongly from, um, from our, our, our evidence, from how children and families report their experience. And so thinking about what, what's needed for equality of opportunity to help education and other systems unlock potential, clearly very important. I want to talk about essentially two, two aspects. The first is to recognize the critical importance of, 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 of undernutrition, malnutrition on, 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 on young children's lives in, in, in um, determining chances. And then I want to talk a little bit about, about learning, about the school, about um, the potential of the school, but also some of the evidence that we see around, around inequalities, inequities um, in education. So the first slide I wanted to, to use was to talk a little bit about undernutrition. Now, I'm only going to talk briefly about undernutrition um, because I want to spend quite a bit of time thinking about the school. But it's a critical issue. Um, the rates, we, we see um, high rates of, of stunting, a key proxy, a key indicator of, 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 of um, chronic undernutrition. We see high rates within the young life samples. Um, uh, stunting is, is recognized um, to be, to be um, a particular problem in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and South Asia. We see that in, in our samples um, as well. It's important in and of itself for what it says about, about um, chronic undernutrition. Um, under nutrition experienced over a long period of time, but also because of what it says about, um, because it's associated with a range of negative outcomes for, 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 for children, um, negative outcomes for children's health, um, negative outcomes as a, as a risk factor in child mortality as well as, 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 well as illness, um, and also because it's related um, to children's ability to learn later, later in life. Um, it's associated with impacts on, um, on, on cognition. So that's, that's kind of one, a key reason for being concerned. Now given all of those, those the, the, that's, a, that's a risk factor um, for children's development, it's notable how even within countries there are stark differences in who is most likely to be experiencing that form of, of disadvantage. So looking across all of our, our samples, um, we see that the poorest um, children in, a, in, a, in, in samples which are, as Ginny uh, I think mentioned, biased slightly towards, towards poorer people in society um, are much, like, much more likely to be, to be stunted than, than the less poor um, within our sample. So if you connect those two points, the fact that the poorest in society are most likely to, to show the signs of undernutrition with all the impacts of um, undernutrition on them, then it clearly emerges as a, as a channel undermining that form of equality of opportunity that, that perhaps we, that we would, would hope. Um, I also just wanted to show a little example from, from, um, from, the, the, uh, from what was the state of Andhra Pradesh in India, looking at, at stunting rates and how those have changed. So one of the features of the Young Life study is that we can both look across children's life courses for the same children, but we can also compare at certain age points what was happening for the, young, for the older cohort with what was happening for the older cohort. So these are children at the same age, this chart there, age 12, um, but the blue line was those when it was uh, in 2006 um, and the red um, in 2013. And what we see there is that there's a slight reduction of, um, of, of the stunting rate. And that's really good news. Not fast enough, but it's good news. But then if you start to disaggregate where the, that gain is happening, what you see very clearly in this example, is that where that gain has happened has actually been for those children who were who initially had the lowest risk of being stunted. Um, where the problem was most acute, actually it's changed much, much, much less. So the poorest third of children see comparatively little gain over this period of time. 
time. So what we, we're seeing in this example, doesn't happen in all examples, but is a concentration of the problem on, 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 on the poorest in, in society. So what might it mean? Um, in terms of this, this point, I think we would want to, to reiterate the absolute central importance of early years policy uh, within, um, in terms of all of the, the, the sustainable development goals that might have to do with, with children, increasing improving the coverage of early years policy um, is, is, is absolutely central, assuring good conditions for young children. But I suppose we would also want to emphasize that a life course perspective on children's development doesn't just stop at the earliest years. You've got to think about the middle, middle, um, middle childhood, you've got to think about the adolescent phase um, as well, and there are advantages in, in doing so. Now, I want to move on to, to learning. And as I, um, I mentioned, it was really striking to see what a powerful, um, uh, what a powerful point came out in, 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 in the video. And, and it's a powerful point that comes out in our, in our data as well. Young people reporting um, views of schooling which are very positive, um, views of schooling that suggest that it, it, it is viewed as life-changing for them. That's an assumption made by policymakers as well in many countries. We're investing heavily in, in, in education because we, we, we hope it'll lead to, to, to improved skills and, and also to social mobility. Then you've got this big question that the SDGs need to confront about, well, with it. Um, we've already heard some of the great successes of the, uh, that have been achieved in recent years, and enrollment rates are an absolute uh, you know, central to that story. It's a great success. But it's well recognized now that, that getting young people, getting children into school doesn't always lead to good learning whilst they're there, and we see that in Young Lives data as well. Why might that be? Well, not all of that will be about the school. The school's important, but it's, there are other factors that affect um, learning. Um, and if you're trying to work out why, this, why different children might gain differently from the same systems, understanding what's going on at the household level as well as what's going on at the school is important. So household poverty emerges as a, as a very big uh, factor impacting on, 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 on young people's lives for many reasons. But we also see that Schooling systems can, can be quite unequal in the opportunities that they deliver to learn, um, perhaps in the facilities, perhaps in the quality of, of, of teaching that goes on within the classroom, perhaps whether the teachers actually attend regularly to teach, to teach the students. If there are unequal opportunities to learn and if some children are already in a position where they're less likely to gain from that, then it's not hard to see um, that there's a problem for those children in so there's potential, clearly, within the SDGs um, for, to take a, a, a really a, a, a new look at what schooling can deliver and is delivering and going well beyond, beyond the enrollment. And I think that's, that's widely recognized within these debates, but there's a question about how to do it. So I want to use a couple of small pieces of data um, from, from Young Lives. Um, the first bit of data that I wanted to use, again, is looking at, at Andhra Pradesh. Uh, this is looking at, at enrolment, but instead of looking at overall enrolment, it's looking at where young people uh, are enrolled. Um, and it's looking at who's enrolled in private schools. Now, these schools are um, part of what you might call a no-fee um, uh, private school system, and that's been increasing quite rapidly um, within, within Andhra Pradesh over the period of the study, um, as we've been following. Um, so some children in, are enrolled in government schools, some children are enrolled in, 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 in private schools. And part of the reason that there's been a rapid increase in private schools has been because parents have often um, believed them to be better, to offer better opportunities for their children. Now, the jury's out about whether that's actually true when you try to, to break down what the, whether um, private schools do yet generally um, deliver higher quality. The evidence is, 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 is mixed. But what we do see is that if you look at what's happening in the gaps about who's in private schooling, who's in government schooling, over the, over the period of, of the study, it's increased. Um, in terms of who ma who's making up those, those um, young people in private schools, um, it's increasingly boys. Boys have been more likely to go into to these private schools than girls, as parents presumably are making choices. And by poverty, it's increased gaps in terms between the, the poorest third and, um, and, and the, the, the least poor third. Over this period of time, the, the least poor third have become much more likely to be in, in, in private schools. So I suppose one point that we would just make is that that process 
is creating some level of social distance, and distance between, between by gender as well. So that was a story about, in a sense, one simple, um, simple illustration of some inequities that exist within school systems. Now, what's really nice about having a four country study is that you can look at where some of the differences are. Now, boiling down why those differences exist is a really, is, is, a, is a complex challenge, but we, we're really interested in findings from, from Vietnam. Um, because Vietnam um, does a number of very interesting things in policy terms and in terms of the outcomes that we see, actually they're, they're, they're often quite positive compared to um, sometimes what we, what we expect. This example is um, actually from, from a school survey that was conducted uh, on, on um, young life children when they were aged about 10 years. And it's over a period of a year, a, a school year, and what it looks at is who's making progress against the curricula that they were being taught uh, on, and breaking that down into different social groups. And for those of you who don't know Vietnam, there are really big differences between the, uh, the ethnic minority population in, 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 in Vietnam and the majority um, kin population. The ethnic minority population is much more, experiences much higher levels of poverty. Um, so what happened? This, what this um, chart illustrates is, uh, is, is, is learning against, the, against tests which are based around the curriculum. This, is, this example is, is maths, but you see a, a, a rather similar picture if you look at, at Vietnamese language skills as well. So, uh, but there may be different reasons for that. So what it does is you, you standardize, we've standardized this at 500. I have no idea why it's 500, but that's pretty common in these sorts of studies. Um, and then you look at the incremental gain made over the, over the school year and who's making that incremental gain. Now the really interesting thing for us is that though you can see that the red line is below the blue line, the red line is the minority population, they know less or they do less well at the, at the, the start of the school year in these tests. Um, and they still do less well at the end of the school year, but that, na that, that gap is narrowing over that period of time. And it's very easy to construct a story about concern about policy, big gaps, big inequalities. Here we see a very positive story about some of the gaps that are narrowing. And as I say, we see it in some other areas um, as well. Why might that be? Well, then, um, again, it's a complex story, but, but looking at what a teaching system um, develops, uh, delivers, is, uh, feels very important. And we see some interesting uh, findings about you know, lower gaps around things like um, opportunities to learn in, 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 in Vietnam. Um, and we see some interesting things about what teachers say and are doing um, in, in, in Vietnam. The, the point that always sticks in my mind is that when you ask children, uh, teachers how much they think they can affect the, the, the children in their classes' um, uh, performance, then they give quite positive results in, 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 in Vietnam. No fatalism about poor children not being able to learn. This is a, a question about how you bring all of the class up, up to a level. And I think that's an interesting point to to think about when we're addressing this, this question. Okay, I want to show one more slide of data, I think, and then try to talk a little bit about um, some of the implications for this. Um, I want to talk about um, gender inequities, absolutely critical issue and well, well discussed within the, um, within the uh, discussions about the SDGs, great concern about um, particularly uh, young women. Uh, being disadvantaged in many countries. So we look at this issue and are, are looking at it quite a bit within the Young Lives study to try to understand where and why gender inequities are formed. Now this is a very simple, <coughs> what's behind this chart is a very simple question which is you know, who's in school, by what ages, comparing um, boys uh, and girls, young men and young women at the last point of, of observation um, when we're talking about education and different forms of, of, of study. Now there are a couple of points that you can see from this chart. Um, if the line is below, if the uh, the bar is below the line, that means it's it's, it's biased in favour of, of, of boys. More boys are in school or education at that point. If it's above the line, it's biased towards towards girls uh, and young women. So what we see is actually quite a different picture across these four countries. These are only four countries. We're not trying to make broader statements about other countries, uh, but these are. It, it is interesting to note that you see different patterns. So for us, the first point for gender analysis is, is, is identifying what the problem is. In Andhra Pradesh, we see really very consistent evidence of growing um, gender disadvantage um, over this, this period of time, and, and quite starkly so at the last point um, 
uh, the last point at age 19, and at that point, as Ginny identified earlier, a number of these, 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 these young women will have had babies and certainly have married. In Ethiopia, and indeed in Vietnam, actually, you see that by 19, more um, young women are in school than, 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 than young men which is an interesting kind of slightly counterintuitive factor of finding in, in, in many ways. Uh, the reasons for that vary between the countries. Um, it may not all be positive. I mean, a lot of these, these young men may have dropped out um, uh, to work and maybe being paid more at that point. And it doesn't prove that young women who've stayed on for schooling long will necessarily get the, 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 the jobs, the livelihood options later. But it's an interesting point. So why do we think this has happened? Um, Three points that I would draw out um, in terms of what shapes decision making about who's staying in school. The first point I wanted to highlight is, is economic pressure. If a household is, is, is under economic pressure, it may well have to make choices. Uh, if it has to make choices, then that may well trigger some level of, of, of discrimination, either by birth order, by, um, by girls and boys, or indeed by um, uh, between who is assumed to be making the best progress in the school. The second point I wanted to highlight was institutional structures. We see a lot of um, trigger points around school exams, uh, where if a, if, a, if a young person doesn't do well in that exam, then that may be a trigger to, to, to people leaving. Uh, we see a great pressure on young women when they have to go and travel, uh, young girls, when they have to travel further, further to school, opening up potential risks around sexual violence. Certainly that gets reported very commonly in, in, in the Indian context. Um, and there's a socio-cultural context as well, and I suppose there I wanted to, to, to identify that we can look at these processes in childhood, but we also need to look at the mm. wider societies. And if these um, young women, or indeed young men, are not going to have good opportunities later in, my, um, in, in, in adulthood, then it's perhaps not surprising that there may be a pressure to leave school earlier. Right, a couple of um, implications. Um, that I just wanted to, to run through, and then I will hand back over to Ginny just to, 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 to conclude on a couple of key points. So implications. The first point that I, I wanted to identify, started, it began by talking a little bit about early nutrition and the impact that that might have on a range of indicators, but also on cognition. The thing I wanted to highlight from, from our evidence is just that the, the cognitive gaps exist before children enter school. So if we're looking at a question of, of, of learning and trying to improve young people's learning, children and young people's learning. Um, we've got to recognize that not all of that, well, quite a lot of that happens before um, children have entered school, and that that's, um, has a number of implications. Um, but um, we also see that they widen, gaps widen, um, during, this, during when children are at school. Um, but the way in which those gaps widen rather varies between the, 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 the school system uh, that, we, that, 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 that exists. Um, the two examples that I, we often like to compare are that of Vietnam and, and, Andhra, and Andhra Pradesh, very different um, country examples, but India and Vietnam have had a, a, a similar GDP per capita. It's interesting that we see the differences that we do. In Vietnam, what we tend to see is that just in terms for every year of, 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 of additional time in school, um, Vietnamese children seem to do, uh, seem to learn more against, um, against tests, but as we saw in the, in the example, there's, there's, there's some positive evidence around greater approach to, to equity delivered by that system. In Andhra Pradesh, we actually see that there's, there's lower additional gain given from, from each of those um, additional school, school years, and we see a number of examples of, 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 of gaps within, within the school system. That's not to suggest that you can necessarily transport one school system to another country, but it's interesting drawing the comparison and thinking why that might be. Um, a couple of points um, uh, to, to, to just draw some of that out. First, in, in, in policy terms. First, early phase of, of, of life is clearly absolutely central. There are a number of clear implications of that around early childhood policies, ECD, um, early child development policies. Um, uh, clearly uh, are very important to that phase. In our data, though we do see quite a few children who have some experience of, of early childhood, actually it's not really the poorest children who have access um, to those services. Uh, where the strong pro public programs, they extend, um, uh, they extend access to wider groups of, of, of 
have children, but often it's the, it's the poorest who haven't had access to early childhood, so extending coverage is, is important. Two, um, household poverty. Um, reducing household poverty is important in and of itself, but it's also a support to, 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 to education. Um, it's really encouraging to see all the emphasis going on around social protection and focusing the, that social protection effort around extending to households with, with children feels a very important uh, agenda, hopefully, for, for, for the SDGs. Three, um, school effectiveness. We talk a lot about learning, we talk a lot about um, access to school, but thinking about what makes an effective school is quite, actually, it's quite a challenging question when you think about it. Um, and for the SDGs, with their greater focus on learning, um, thinking about that, that issue of school effectiveness is, 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 is very important. Fourth, um, school is important for learning, but it's also a space that young people spend an awful lot of their time. Um, and with increasing uh, enrolment rates, then it's covering a lot of children. So what is the potential to, to capitalize on that? How can we build on that for other, other purposes? I just wanted to highlight the simple example of school feeding programs. We see some quite positive evidence around nutritional uh, impacts of school feeding programs in, in, in India, and that's, that's really encouraging. Um, and perhaps it suggests, well, it shows the potential of, of school as a platform to do some of this delivery of holistic um, child development um, services that, that, that Ginny started us off by talking about. Fifth, um, gender disadvantage. We need to get good at and better um, at this. But it both requires a focus on, 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 on policy um, for children directly. We see a number of examples of that in the Young Lives um, country, some active focus in India on extending access to education for, for, for girls and for, for, for those from marginalized social groups. But it, all of that sits within a wider societal structure. So we're think, when we're thinking about children and what's shaping decision making around children, we also need to think about that wider power and other social structures. Jenny. Thanks. Oops. Um, Okay, just one last slide really on, on final reflection, reflections from all of this. The UN uh, General, uh, General Assembly report emphasizes uh, very neatly the need to reduce implementation gaps between the principles and rights enshrined in the UN CRC and the actual living conditions of the most marginal, marginalized and excluded girls and boys who are left behind, or one should perhaps say left out. And it also emphasises that many children find themselves living with multiple risks and multiple hazards. Action must be based on must be on the basis of mappings of vulnerability that reflects these complexities. <coughs> and, I mean, this is something that we feel that Young Lives is well placed to contribute to these debates about. And it is complex, and policymakers don't like complex complexity. But I think it's important that this multiple risks and multiple hazards idea is brought through into policy. As Paul has said already, the, the, the sustainable development goals offer us an opportunity. There's also an opportunity for what's being talked about uh, in the high, UN High Level Panel report about data re revolution, which has the potential to increase the profile of children. And, and as Paul has already said, the key messages here, we suggest, must be around increasing social, social protection coverage for households with children and identifying and improving the, the effectiveness of school for poorer and marginalized children. So that's the end of the presentation. If anybody's interested in finding out more, this is the website. I should emphasize that our survey data are publicly archived. So if anybody wants to access and utilize the survey data, they are free to do so. Uh, we produce a number of publications and it just leaves me to acknowledge and thank hugely the Young Lives children, parents and caregivers, as well as everybody else who's involved in the study, especially our field workers, data managers, survey enumerators, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much indeed. Very good. Thank you very much, Jeannie and Paul. I want to call our panelists, uh, Nick Garipur, who is and Shantanu Mukher, yeah? if you can pass here, please. So, let me.
introduce, uh, we have two great panelists. Uh, it is supposed that we, we have a third one that is uh, Rosa Hill, that she ran an important NGO here in, uh, in New York because we want to mix and to show that something is going on here in New York, but she has an attack on asthma today, that things happen and she can, can, cannot come. So, Nick, uh, we are a very good friend, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, on top of that, and maybe very important, he was the former director of the program division in UNICEF, uh, that uh, is the, probably the one of, maybe the most important division <laughs> in UNICEF. I don't want to say nothing, but it's the division that is taking the program ahead and uh, has a different division and is trying to put in place all the things and projects that we are discussing. And now he is the senior advisor on the post-2015 development agenda. So welcome. Thank you so much. And we have the other panelist is Chantanu Mukherjee, that is the head of the UNDP MDG Dems in the Devel Development Policy Bureau. Uh, Chantanou is a development practitioner and microeconomist, and the idea is that I will pose to them two questions, so to have brief answers, and uh, from different point of view, because they what we, what we are trying to convey is different perspective and different experience on this question that we are discussing, no? So one is from UNICEF, but the other is a more a vision from more economic things and more general or different things. So the, the first question for, for both of you is what do you think in view of the finding that Young Life showed to us? and in your own experience, what mat matters most to deliver a good life chance for children living in poverty? And if you can suggest us three key priorities for policy and programs. So, uh, who want to start? Um, me? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto, colleagues. It's, uh, great pleasure to be here uh, and like all of you um, equity and the universality of children's rights mm -hmm. is a very personal um, experience it's something that drives everything that we do everything that we um, commit to do now and into the future and it's great to be to be here um, what matters the most I think from the, the study um, and from our practical field experience, um, it is absolutely critical that um, there is a policy commitment to reaching uh, the uh, poorest and the most disadvantaged first. Mm -hmm. To make a big distinction between a trickle-down approach where eventually everybody gets reached at least theoretically. But the question here is making a policy decision and a commitment to reach the poorest and the most disadvantaged um, first. And this is both complex and simple in the sense that because the study is located within the paradigm of child poverty, we have to understand that it is not just one silver bullet that needs to reach the poorest first. It's a multi-dimensional um, situation. Uh, and so there are going to be um, equalizing policies. There are going to be deliberate policies that narrow the gap or lift the curve for the poor. Um, and there are going to be almost affirmative action type policy interventions that uh, would cause acceleration, um, even if we're talking about coverage 
or uh, about the uptake of services uh, and so on. And lastly, um, I think it is critical to realize that the early years don't start with the day the child is born. They start with the mother. So maternal health and nutrition, women's social uh, and economic status in, in society, um, and where the woman is coming from matters a lot more than we uh, at the policy level realize. Um, and so the first thousand days, the cliche word, but it is about the mother and those very early um, days, very early um, uh, few days of the child's life. Um, and, um, and I think in looking at the interventions, I'm sure we'll come to those, it is critical um, that the demand side, which is empowerment strategies, strategies that move away from um, looking at poor households, poor children, poor women as passive recipients of aid to investments and policy decisions that deliberately empower and uplift um, the um, voices, the condition, uh, and the participation of uh, local populations, local women's groups, local leaders, um, so that they are, in turn, able to play a, a role uh, in all of this. And for that to happen, nothing better than decent work and the ability to earn uh, a wage. So let me sort of pause there with those reflections before we get into the technical, uh, specific sectoral interventions. Thank you very much, Nick. And Shantanu, uh, yes. Well, uh, let me also begin by thanking Alberto, the new school, and Gune for this opportunity to reflect on some terribly important and very useful findings that the study is bringing out. Uh, as, well, as Alberto mentioned, uh, I work on the MDGs, and one of the interesting things about working on the MDGs is that it gives you license to really look at a whole host of issues. And uh, it's always interesting to learn more and make connections. So this must have been uh, Child Poverty Month for me, because uh, just a week back, I was uh, first in Pakistan which has the second largest number of out-of-school children in the world, at six million, about 12%, uh, trying to help figure out how the UN system and the World Bank working together could do something to address this issue. And a little prior to that, I was in Laos PDR, which has one of the highest rates of child stunting, uh, which I'm sure is well known to all of you, but was new to me. And uh, what is more distressing is that it is falling slower than the population growth rate there. So you're actually adding children who are going to be stunted. And uh, what is also alarming that stunting rates among the wealthiest quintile based on this asset index measure uh, is, as, is as high as 20%. So, you know, I mean, uh, it, it just points out, I think, some of the issues that have been so eloquently placed here about the complexity of these issues we are dealing with. And uh, Nick already mentioned the silver bullet example. And uh, I think uh, it allows me also to share with you my reflections on reading the study. And at the, since we are constrained to just three points, uh, I think the first takeaway point for me is that is the increasing degree of interconnectedness of all development outcomes. And uh, I think as we start moving away, as we start making more and more progress, and we are moving away from the very high levels of deprivation to levels that are slightly lower, I think it's more and more important to appreciate this interconnectedness. Because it means that continuing to work as we have always done may not be the most efficient way of getting results. Uh, we are reaching diminishing marginal returns sometimes. I mean, just to give you an example from some work I did in Uganda, the choice was between uh, building more schools in, in an area which had, which had started off with very low levels of uh, you know, school provision, 
But over the, since the adoption of the Millennium Development Goals, this had crept up, so school coverage was not too bad. Or actually making sure that the teacher's attendance at the schools went up beyond 50%, which it was on any one day. Now, you can understand the politics and the policy implications of both. But clearly, building another school, if you had to invest a limited amount of money, building another school was probably going to be less effective than making sure your teaching manpower was there uh, at 100%. So, but when you, when you think of it that way, you also understand that the forces that are keeping teachers away from schools are far more complex than what the education se sector and what its reward and incentive structure can actually influence. So right away, because you have actually picked the low-hanging fruit in a sense, you've built the schools, you've taken care of some of the supply side, you now have to move towards the high-hanging fruit. And the high-hanging fruit may be something which the sector itself may not be best placed to address. There are other issues that need to be taken into account, and therefore, not only are development outcomes interconnected in research or in a paradigm or in theory, but they're also interconnected at a very fundamental level when you're trying to get impact. Uh, when we move to the high-hanging fruit, as we are doing now, I think the, the study brings out some of these points very well. We need sustained attention. It's not enough to uh, have it at a particular point in time or a particular point in the life cycle. It needs to be sustained. <laughs> We need to address quality, which is you know, terribly thorny issue. Uh, Nick mentioned how we need to complement the supply with demand, and I would also say we need to improve accountability. Mm -hmm. And these are all things that we need to do if we are going to start moving towards the high-hanging fruits of development. And my final point would be that, uh, again, the mandate that's coming out from discussions around the SDGs and actually from the country's own aspirations, which I think is more important than what the General Assembly does or doesn't do, uh, is really this need to reach all, everyone. And I don't think as a policy community or even as a research community, we have fully grappled with the implications of what it means to reach all. What it means to cover the last mile to go from 90% to 100%. And I think as we reflect on this as practitioners, as people who work in the field, who work with partners, we will see more and more that we need to do things differently. The tide that lifted school enrollment uh, through quick wins from 40% to 90% uh, may not be the one that delivers the last 10% of the school. And this imperative of uh, covering everybody, leaving no one behind, means that we have to think differently about how we do business, but also how we measure. Uh, I, I have survey experts in this room. I don't need to tell them, or, this, or I don't need to share with them the horror stories of trying to find an event which is rare and occurs only 10% of the time, and you have you know, a limited budget with which to capture it. Thank you very much, Shantanu. So the second question is about the challenge, yeah? So because we, these are very good uh, point, but there are many challenges. What are the, the most important challenge that you are thinking that we are facing in the next now and in the next future years, you know, in this very complicated world that we are seeing now? So. You, do you want to, to start? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the challenges are multifaceted, but I think it's uh, really not a gloom and doom scenario. I mean, we've learned a lot since uh, these kind of coordinated efforts came into place. Uh, we've had plenty of experiences in countries uh, on how to do better. And I think if I think about challenges and take a step back so that I'm looking at the bigger picture, to my mind, what comes through is three main issues. And in all of these, we have made some progress, but not nearly enough. 
the first one, I think, is to unpack a little bit. We often hear this buzzword about national ownership and political uh, leadership. And I think we need to unpack a little bit what it means and recognize that it is only the very first step towards reaching results. So what can we do to enhance the efficacy of the next steps that would be there? So, you know, for example, in, just to go back to Pakistan and last PTR, the incentives for political leadership and ownership vary across countries. Now in Pakistan, the Prime Minister made a commitment to deliver 4% of the GDP for education and has decentralized extensively so provinces have a great deal of autonomy in planning and budgeting around education. These would seem to be hopeful steps, but obviously with a tax to GDP ratio of about 2% in Pakistan, how 4% is going to be delivered for education is a bit of a question mark. But it also says that intentions are not good enough. We have to improve something outside of the education sector, just in order to deliver on what has been promised for the education sector. And in Lao PDR, the government has a national aspiration to escape LDC status. And one of the indicators by which you're assessed as having escaped that status is the percentage of malnourishment. So clearly in both these countries, there are public commitments to doing something about nutrition, about education, but how do you translate this commitment into action is the challenge that we have to work with. Um, clearly, as, uh, you know, as Paul said, uh, these are countries, most of the developing countries have shown strong growth, so the fiscal space is opening up there. Uh, but we have to see how that is translated into opportunity. And so from our experience, we find that uh, the one, one sort of approach which works in these circumstances is actually to not speak to the converted, but to speak to the skeptics. And to speak about how they are going to balance, make arguments that make sense to them in their own language. Uh, when you're sitting with the finance ministry official or you're sitting with the planning commission, uh, that person is juggling a whole range of issues, challenges, and albeit the development parameters are interconnected, this person is tasked with making trade-offs. On the one hand, you can speak about increasing the pie, creating more fiscal space through better tax administration, collection, liquidity over time, and so on. But then you also have to understand the language with which you approach them and make the case for greater investment in this area for its long-term potential, but also for its immediate ones. The second challenge which I think we have all met is uh, how to foster the collaboration across sectors. I mean, in a, any kind of good outcome that we are trying to get is going to need a mix of sectoral activities and activities from outside the sector. Just to give you an example in Benin, uh, the work we were doing over there was about expanding access to water, drinking water. And uh, the country actually has a really good rural water supply extension program, which is reaching very far flung areas. <coughs> but that is owned by the public health engineering department or uh, something like that. So where is the incentive of the public health engineering department to see that when a young girl's time to collect water gets cut down and she actually has more time on her hands, that she spends it in going to school or in some learning activity? No, they measure their progress by the number of water points connected and population served, and they'll do a periodic test on the quality of water, which is their mandate. But where is the incentive for them to translate this into a learning dividend? It's not there. And where is the incentive for the education department to piggyback on the rollout of the water supply extension scheme? Because they're responding to a different set of parameters and annual work plans and so on. And sorry, our budget is already committed and we didn't know they were going to do this. So how are you going to bring these together? Um, as one gets into the nitty gritty of this kind of structure, the incentives that are needed for joint work, we really find them to be absent and sometimes even sort of disincentivized. Uh, I would say that's another challenge that we need to look at and maybe we can pick up some more things in the course of the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick, I'm sure that we'll have some discussion here. Nick, should I? Okay. 
let me just compliment um, uh, Shantanu's uh, very good points. One major challenge is capacity uh, and resources. Um, it's no secret that much of what needs to be delivered um, in terms of public health, education, nutrition support, protection, all gravitate towards the same public sector uh, budget and the same um, officials at the uh, decentralized level. Um, and most countries, especially in the uh, developing world, are grappling constantly with chronic shortages of staff, capacity, and resources. Um, and so in all of the efforts that we make, particularly where you're talking about a multi-sectoral strategy that needs to hit different types of um, outcomes um, to be effective, um, the first major challenge is always where is the resources going to come from? Where is the additional capacity going to come from? And so you find that in practice, um, uh, policy makers are challenged with robbing Peter to pay Paul mm -hmm. or basically just making him do muddling through with very little resources and the resulting donor dependence uh, which has hurt a lot of the systems out there. Um, and so a major challenge is capacity, resources um, and um, very weak um, systems um, and accountability, transparency, uh, aspects related to the oversight of these systems being particularly weak um, as you go along. And the reason this is important is that when you look at early childhood development or the types of uh, results that we are looking for which go beyond the ability of one sector or one uh, department single-handedly to, to deliver, um, you're looking at a government counterpart system that does not have um, the ability to coordinate and lead all of this work that involves the Ministry of Health or the Health Department, education, uh, um, and other uh, uh, parts of the government system uh, in one place. So. Uh, the health people have their health programs and their health targets and their health ob objectives, yet they are absolutely critical to what happens to early childhood um, and cognitive development. Um, the social welfare de department deals with another set or another part of that, uh, of that reality. Um, and there's usually a spread across different um, institutions and different offices of the responsibility and the accountability to lead in this area. Um, and so this fragmentation not only makes um, uh, it difficult because of the duplication, wastage of resources, um, but also very, very difficult to coordinate uh, work uh, in, in situations of weak systems uh, and oversight. Um, how does one address this situation. To me, my experience is that uh, what I have observed so far uh, at country level is uh, the, um, uh, the critical value of policy coherence at the planning and the strategic level uh, where the conceptualization happens rather than um, a project approach to financing and addressing these issues. So, um, so that if early childhood care and development is a national development strategy, say, in Rwanda, then the orchestration, the conceptualization, the financing of uh, this national uh, priority is done at the level of a the presidency or the Ministry of Plan and Finance that has a convening power over a number of sectoral ministries rather than just one sector 
uh, single-handed. So that's one aspect that I would like to, to highlight. Um, the other uh, relates to um, the interconnectedness of uh, the programmatic uh, uh, interventions. What comes to my mind as I listen to you, uh, Shantanu, was the experience in India uh, in polio eradication, mm -hmm. where um, for several years, 10 to 15 years, um, children were receiving repeated doses of the oral polio vaccine over and over again, um, but you always had um, polio cases in Bihar uh, and parts of uh, Uttar Pradesh. Um, and the reason was that because we were dealing with an oral polio vaccine that required um, a gut reaction uh, that would kick in with the immunity in a situation where environmental sanitation um, and uh, the quality of water and personal hygiene, etc., was so low that children were having such repeated bouts of diarrhea that the vaccine never really kicked in. And so there was this continuous effort to vaccinate until the water and sanitation team got brought along to join the polio effort of the public health uh, team. And some 7,000 house-to-house social mobilizers were deployed to go house to house um, to really talk to communities uh, and work with local communities to improve uh, hygiene practices, sanitation, and so on. That illustrates the fact that as we move into the new development uh, context, um, where the level of ambition that's envisaged brings together climate change, economic development, and uh, social development into one so-called sustainable development framework. A level of ambition requires that we clearly move into a new institutional arrangement that, and that underscores the need for multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships uh, and uh, uh, sectoral action. So that water and sanitation um, and people's knowledge, health literacy, and nutrition literacy levels are critical for uh, the outcomes that we are looking for uh, in health, um, in early childhood development, and particularly in nutrition. One cannot conceptually um, develop nutrition support programs to tackle stunting without dealing with the water sanitation and hygiene aspects, and that's that's a critical factor, or um, the deworming um, aspects which um, afflict the same children uh, that we're talking about here. So that even if you have school feeding programs and you're not deworming children, there's no sanitation. In fact, you are only feeding the worms. So those are the thank additional you. aspects of that. Thank you very much. I think that this opened the, the the floor, let's open the floor, because I am sure that, and maybe you can move yeah. also. Yes. So if there's yes. any question, sure. please. Uh, yeah, there's one question there. Yes. It looks rather nice. And I forgot to bring mine. Thanks very much, uh, Christian Salazar from, from UNICEF. I mean, first, congratulations, I to really to, to all the panelists for really, really, I think, very strong and interesting discussion we're having. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I have, um, I wake up with Ebola, then I go to the winterization and the impact on millions of children in the Syria crisis. We look at the Intifada coming back we look at the situation in South Sudan and Chad, and we see that from climate change to growing conflict to uh, fiscal deficits, <laughs> all the factors are there uh, that we will see uh, 
quickly growing fragility in the world, that's an assumption. And already today, the largest cohorts of children unreached by any service live in fragile countries. And the discussion that we've been hearing, which actually is excellent, and it really reflects also a lot of thinking and discussion, but is somehow uh, based, and even the examples of your lives, on quite steady development paths. But we're looking at least, uh, I mean, at least where I'm sitting, in a different, into a different future, which is really worrisome. So my question, I guess, is maybe to Paul or to, I, I don't know really to address it, um, if you look at the SDGs in the future and the, you know, the impact that we can expect in growing conflict and disasters on children, what are the policy choices there or how should we make those connections um, uh, for the future of you know, a growing cohorts of children to say those not left behind will live in those situations? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take this, some other... Thank you so much uh, for sharing um, you know, this eye-opening you know, findings, and it's a really some interesting you know, the data. But uh, let me start with the word that you have used, the poverty, inequality, you know, kind of thing. These are very loaded words. It's a very contextual, and I'm coming back to uh, some of the things that you mentioned. So, how, you know, in, in your study, how do you define the term poverty? Because it differs from India to Ethiopia to Vietnam. And so that might have, you know, some kind of um, cascading or whatever the model you say kind of impact. But, you know, these, again, I mean, the, the issues of poverty and education and resources also do not have one-to-one -one correspondence. And I can just give one example. In here, in the United States, in a particular community in Chicago for last seven, eight years, more than 100 children got killed in gang fights, despite all resources, despite you know, all intervention. So when you, you know, so my question is that, have you seen any correlation when the program that comes from top down. So you mentioned about India program of Manerega, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, kind of that. But just today, there's a data, and it's a huge um, human crime in India, that <coughs> within five months, 250 farmers committed suicide in Telangana, the, the state that you mentioned. Mm. And so far, Indian government, the new prime minister or anything has done nothing, nothing at all. So how that's impacting in terms of you know, the children who were there? And I can give another example when children begged money, um, you know, putting their father's dead body on the road to give a, a proper funeral. So you can imagine how you know, the desperate situation. But let me... So, so that's my question, but I also try to see, uh, you know, some, uh, what you said, there is a light in after every uh, tunnel. So there, again, there is no correlation between the things that we observed in Ethiopia, where girls are going to school in a large number compared to other countries, when in Ethiopia, according to your even development report, on the bottom. So there is no correlation how you imply or what the difference is. But as I said, my question is, do you see any kind of correlation between upper programming intervention versus local program intervention in terms of your data? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. There is any other one? Yeah, let's take three, but please two short uh, questions. We have one here. I want okay. and after. I, I just want to. I just wanted to ask for a clarification about the data presented by uh, Paul regarding gender. There, there was age 12, 15, and 19. I wanted to know if all the data there in, um, were from the same cohort, or, or the second cohort was also used for the data for the age and 12. Just, just a clarification. 
come here and come back there. Yeah? So we can move from one. <coughs> I was just wondering, how do you expect to reach children that aren't registered by the state? They don't have a birth certificate, they're basically, they don't exist. And you're saying you should start at the bottom, but these are the people that are usually at the bottom, the people that don't have an identity, that are exposed to all these horrible things, and how can you deal with that? Thank you. So. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. This has been a really interesting panel. Thank you all. You had one finding about the cognitive, the cognitive gaps between the social groups were well in place before the children entered school. Paul, and I think you mentioned too that the, the gaps widened with the impact of the school system. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate that a little bit more because as you know, in the United States, and that is involved with this for five years, we evaluated the Early Head Start Research Project, and we followed 3,000 moms and kids for five years from the day the children were born. And 85% of those children were about a standard deviation behind when they even started school at 36 months. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on your findings about the preschoolers and what those cognitive gaps were. And how are we going to address some of these challenges to address early childhood needs? Because early childhood education is just so important. And we're not seeing it in the developing world. Thank you. Thank so you the last. Stop now and then a eh? second round. Because that's a lot of questions. No, no. We have <laughs> one more there. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we, are coming to the, we are coming to the panel and we are closing. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, the, the study was was uh, was a great actually great diversity. So I, I liked also the, the changes and, and the differences in, in the correlations. So one point that that a little bit um, is strengthening some some ideas that that we had in mind is that poverty is not everything. So the case of India and the correlation between the starting rates within different quintiles and different castes and whatever you can, you can, you can look at, it, it showed that maybe we, there are other elements of capacity that need to be looked at and need to be studied as root causes of child rights not being fulfilled. So, so looking at the knowledge and, 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 the, and the proverb that says, that says that ignorance kills more than anything else. Um, that is something which, which probably we need to invest more and more on and, 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 uh, and look at how, what then, what type of interventions do we need to promote more to reach the fulfillment of the rights of, of more children. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, I want to come back to the panel and maybe because we want to close and we have a cocktail so we can have face-to-face -face conversation. So let's come back to the panel. Okay, really quickly, can I just deal with Christian's very important point about the fact that Young Lives is not a study that's taking place. You can use the... The microphone, okay. <coughs> I mean, this is, this, is a re this is obviously of crucial importance that I would just say. We need more longitudinal studies and we need to try to do them in conflict with <coughs> affected states. That is actually a big challenge. But the Young Life Study countries, we can't suddenly say, I don't want to be doing it in these uh, fast, fast growing economies. We can't just jump ship and say, oh, not interesting anymore. I mean, it's, it's really a problem. So let's see some more uh, birth cohort studies taking place in these very problematic parts of the world, would be my suggestion. So I'm going to let Paul deal with all the other questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I might just intervene. I've written them all down. That was a lot. Yeah. Fine. How so do we define poverty, poverty in the study? Uh, 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 Could you just talk to how, how, how poverty yeah, is defined? Let me, let me make a run at some of those, those, those questions. Yep. Um, I won't get them all because my memory is of limited capacity. Um, and first, can I say thank you very much to yes. the discussants because Excellent. those were such thoughtful yep. comments. And taking it to... What Ginny and I did was we talked about, about data, but you were setting up in the context of government and of, of, of what you need in the systems, and that's absolutely critical. And I, I mean, I just briefly wanted to reflect on two of the points that I thought that really came strongly to me. 
to, 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 to what you were saying. I, I mean, one was just returning to this issue of, 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 of decent work. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to link that slightly to the, the comment that was being made in relation to, to, to the Indian circumstance. Mm -hmm. And um, you were referring, I think, to, 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 to many of the economic pressures on, on particularly presumably the farming community and what that, that's, that's led to. Um, and the importance of, 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 of decent work in being able to pay a sustained livelihood is, 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 is clearly absolutely critical. Um, there's a demographic context to, to, to all of this um, as well. When they're looking at, at youth transitions, there's, a, there's got to be a question about what are those young people going to be doing. And if, if, if the world isn't generating sufficient decent jobs, then it's a, it's a, it's a big question. It's clearly a huge national, national challenge. So that was one thing that really struck me about the comments. The other thing was this issue about um, integration policy synergies, how do, you, how do you make that breakthrough for the very marginalised in society? Huge policy challenge, but I thought what was quite interesting was some of the examples that were starting to be given about um, you know, some areas where that, that's worked. I mean, um, the issue of, 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 of polio um, and the role of, 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 of WASH services in that was quite interesting um, rejoined to, to this issue about well, how do you incentivise policy action in one siloed sector that supports another. And, and I was just thought that was a very nice reflection. And the other uh, was mention of, of, of deworming processes. I mean, that's, uh, that's in many ways, as a, it could be seen as a health nutritional intervention, but it's, it's got educational implications as well. So picking on th these sorts of examples where we can think about how to support those sorts of, those forms of integration was really, really very important, I thought. Just a couple of points of clarity. Um, uh, of course, measuring poverty is, 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 is a difficult, um, challenging question, both a conceptual question um, and also relates to different national um, circumstances. What we were referring to was um, uh, differences in wealth levels, wealth being a summary indicator of, um, of, 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 of housing conditions, service access and consumer durable access at a household level. And we were comparing um, those who had a higher level of wealth on that level with those who had a lower wealth level of wealth, but you can you can break these things down in different ways, but we were trying to show the inequities in our sample. That was one point of clarification. Um, the other point of clarification related to gender, that's the same cohort, that's following the older cohorts through. We can talk in more, more detail, but that, that's what that was. Um, Ginny's talked a little bit about conflict. I mean, I think that, that was a very fair kind of um, question. We won't really give a good answer to, 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 to that very important issue beyond to say that, that there are aspects of fragility and post-conflict in the studies that in the countries that we are looking at, um, Vietnam, um, there's fragility in, in parts of, of, of Ethiopia. So, um, but it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's clearly a, a question when we're thinking about how to get to the most marginalized at a national level. I mean, clearly that's critical. I wanted to just to say two more quick things, one of which is this kind of critical issue that's, that's always been part of the issue of the, of, of, of the convention, which is securing good registration, it's making sure that we've got good lists of which children are in, in society so that we can know what's going on about, about their, 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 their rights. Just one kind of positive example there, I think, is, is, is the extent to which things like um, social protection systems can help in supporting, the, um, do, um, incentivizing getting better registration. Um, of those in society, maybe it doesn't reach um, all, but, but looking for positive solutions um, there. The other uh, comment I just wanted to make was around um, early child development. I won't get into discussions about the standard deviations, so we've got a paper that I li I'd like to share that, that mm -hmm. tries to talk about the relative gain through the schooling um, process, but I won't talk, uh, talk about that kind of technical detail um, now. What I did want to talk about was, was, was reach of, of, of ECD programs. And there's another question about the quality of those ECD programs. I, I mean, clearly, it is a huge, hugely important um, agenda. Um, we've done a bit of work trying to map what's happening about ECD processes or what's happened about ECD uh, within, within the Young Lives um, uh, children's experience. Um, and we see some differences across, across uh, the, the uh, Across, across the countries. Um, I wanted to highlight that where the reach of those pro the, the, of ECD has been greatest in the Young Lives countries has really been um, in Peru and in India where there were public programs which tried to extend access. Um, the example where we have least access is in Ethiopia where it was almost entirely a private, um, a pri a private system, so there is an early childhood policy. 
um, a policy thrust. But if you leave it to the market, then the poorest children are not going to get access to, to early childhood. Um, then there are obvious questions about quality and maximizing um, quality um, that need to be, to be attended to. I just wanted to, to, as a final comment, return to something which I think was, was kind of voiced a bit by both of, both, both, both of you in the, in, in the discussion points, but also I think goes to, to some of the ECD um, points as well, which is that in a sense when I look at our data, what it makes me think is that in policy terms, if you reach the poorest children and you do so effectively, you'll sort of, you'll have sorted out all of many of the other problems as well. Not all of the problems, I, I take the, the, the concern that was being raised um, in the back, um, there are issues of, 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 of kind of social norms, other things that are, are important also. But if you're trying to make a really big impact on many of these issues, um, if you've addressed what's going on for the most marginalized children, then I think many of the other problems that we're, we're, we're seeing will follow. But anyway, I think that's the that's mm -hmm. comment. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Any? Well, I wanted to, to maybe pick up from there. I'm sure you're, you're thinking what I thinking in the sense that uh, thanks so much, uh, Christian, for raising the issue of the fragility of, of societies uh, and, um, and the risk of unrest. Uh, because as a matter of fact, uh, the connection is that if, in fact, um, we look 15 years down the road into the future, 2030, and all the ambitious um, goals that are being uh, discussed um, and the vision that is behind those goals, the level of ambition uh, and the, the world that's envisaged is directly threatened by issues of insecurity, fragility, and unrest. I mean, there's no other development context that amplifies quite as much um, as uh, situations of, uh, of fragility, conflict, chronic complex emergencies, including those that are um, multiple in nature, overlapping, so to speak, and concurrent. Um, and so one has got to take a step back and ask, what are the policy and programmatic options available, really? I mean, you can, of course, provide responses by uh, providing humanitarian assistance. But I think where you're trying to get is to look at the root causes and the underlying causes and go back to some of the same issues that we are talking about here. Investing early, bridging the gap, narrowing the gap between those who have something at stake and those who have nothing at stake and nothing to lose, and taking a long-term perspective on this investment. Because until we make that reality, the operational paradigm for tackling um, conflict, uh, insecurity, uh, extremism, um, I don't believe there is a single way that uh, one vaccine can resolve this issue. We've got to go back and address the underlying um, uh, structural anomalies that underlie uh, this kind of perpetual exclusion um, and the extremism that, that flows from there. Unfortunately, if you look at it from that perspective, you get a very big sense of urgency mm. because yeah, it absolutely. looks like we haven't yeah. been really tackling the issue for a long, long time, particularly education, investing in early childhood, uh, and narrowing the gap. Because if we don't narrow the gap and we make a lot of progress, but in making that progress, we lose what this is what this is Absolutely. equity, this is about equity. Uh, and that's the, that's the story of our discussion. Uh, and we must measure it and report on whether or not the equity gaps are stagnating and narrowing or uh, are uh, widening. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's terribly unfair to be the last speaker <laughs> when, <laughs> when you know so many good things have already been said and you realize that everything you wanted to say has gone down already. But uh, I just wanted to pick up on the points Nick was making about uh, fragility and how to deal with it. Um, I think fragility is again something that's um, incredibly important. It threatens a lot of the gains we have made and makes it harder to 
go to uh, completion. But I think we also have to recognize that there is a continuum in the term fragility itself. And by way of full disclosure, let me say that I used to work for a long time in India as a district officer, including running the polio immunization yeah. campaign. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. So, so uh, and, and when I hear the term fragility, it reminds me that in large multi-ethnic states, there are parts, constituent parts, that are moving in and out of the fragile state condition uh, all the time. And for varying periods, uh, varying durations. Uh, for a long time uh, in the part of India that I worked, uh, government services just could not be provided in certain areas that were under the control of so-called rebels, and you would have seen that in Telangana as well. Uh, on the other hand, you have situations like in Yemen right now, where the entire central state structure has collapsed. But I think what it points to is the need for us to be flexible and engage with the diversity of actors. Uh, because different actors deliver services at different places. And we have to see how to engage with them and build up that capacity as well. It's not always the state actor that provides the most, most effective actor. And the second thing I think is, as Nick pointed out, actually fragility and development are very closely connected. And the antidote to one is probably also the antidote to the other. And the more conscious we are of building this into our work so that our humanitarian work actually leads to longer term development gains as well, instead of just taking care of the immediate problem, I think the better the chances of success. And finally, just a quick reflection on the point that was made about uh, how to make sure that we're reaching the, you know, uh, the really hard to reach children. Um, I think as uh, Paul was mentioning, some of these social protection programs which more and more countries are rolling out are giving a tremendous boost to actually issuing identity documents and identity cards. Uh, India, for example, now has a universal identification scheme with, uh, with linked to electronic fund transfer, and so on. Uh, and there are many other countries actually investing in this kind of thing, which opens up the potential for addressing some of those issues. I remember from my time there, uh, I always thought a lot of my staff were busy doing some kind of survey or the other. You had the below poverty line survey to identify people who would benefit from certain programs. You had the electoral rolls updating survey because you have to make sure that your electoral roll is current when there are elections. You have the land record survey because you want to make sure that your land records are in place. And you have the census, which comes every 10 years. And I'm not even talking about the regular, you know, the sample survey for income and consumption, which happens every five years. So I think there is tremendous potential for within the normal administrative working in many countries, not all of course, to actually complete the mapping of which household is living where, what condition it is in, and being able to track how they are themselves progressing over time through various sort of uh, vicissitudes of fortune. So um, I think uh, the potential is there. It depends on how best we can support it, how best we can actually transfer the knowledge of what's working well in country to another. And I think that's where um, some of our organizations and some of the work that we do actually have a big role to play. Uh, so that this transfer of knowledge and this transfer of uh, technology is facilitated, works well, and gives real benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to call Michael Cohen, that is the Director of International Affairs. And uh, I want to say that uh, he support equity for children from the beginning. We start, and he, he said, well, go ahead, move ahead, and uh, we always not only agree on many things, we are close friends, but also he is a big supporter to put in equity for children at the new school, and he's the director of international affairs, so he agreed on saying some final remarks. Thank you very much. I'd just like to uh, congratulate all the, the members of the panel and, and the speakers uh, 
for a very rich evening and conversation. Listening to, I'd like to make a couple of comments about what I heard. Um, one of the things that struck me is that the study demonstrates the, the complexity of cumulative causation and how outcomes are not tied to individual inputs and, and there's a whole set or a series of outcomes that the complexity of the patterns of causation um, very frequently in development policy discussions, we don't really come clean with those. We don't really indicate, yes, this is the, this is the result of many different things. And we constantly plead ignorance because we don't have enough longitudinal studies. So now we have longitudinal study and we see this complexity. But that, in the conversation, it seems to me that that causes another dilemma which is that once you understand that pattern of cumulative causation, what do you think about with regard to policy and institution? So the second half, the, the second two speakers were really talking about the complexities and the difficulty of applying uh, understanding where you, you have cumulative causation. And what struck me in, in this was that Nobody really wanted to go out on a limb and say, for example, um, which interventions are more cost effective than others. We don't really know about effectiveness. You know, I mean, the, the example of the, the, uh, the polio vaccination was fascinating in terms of you know, the relationship with water and these things. So does that lead you to the conclusion that you do water before you do polio? Or, or what? So it raises questions about sequencing it raises questions about priorities, and it may be that our lack of real understanding of sequencing mm -hmm. doesn't let us adequately take advantage of, of our understanding of multiple causation, of cumulative causation. So the question of sequencing is really interesting. And it's not just a problem unique to this sector. You see it in macroeconomic policy. You see it in every sector. Right? That's one part of it. The other thing that struck me, and that was in the richness of the, of the comments where country examples were invoked, whether, for example, the, the startling result of a stunting in, in Laos, is this a function, is this a cultural phenomenon? Is this related to the overall other contextual variables that are producing this? Which got me thinking, as you're going along, that there may be situations where really good policy um, at, with regard to specific kinds, let's say, uh, getting young girls into education, really a focused policy, whether um, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition to allow something to go further or, or to get the full benefits of these things. So I'm wondering about the relationship between sort of more macro things going on in the country and the fiscal base. I mean, in the end, we need a fiscal base to provide the vaccinations or to do the healthcare services or to build the schools. So, what is, is there? The, is there a relationship between the macro and the micro? We had a seminar here in this room four or five years ago, where somebody said we can't understand why Bangladesh suddenly improved, reduced their fertility rate so much. Because we couldn't find any macro explanation for that. It just, it, it happens from, from policy. It was pretty interesting because it was, a, I think it was somebody, it was somebody from the UN system who, I forget which agency, but, but the point being that um, how important is the context, how important does the context affect this patterns of multiple causation. So I guess it means we've got to do a lot more research. <laughs> we've got to do a lot more, and longitudinal analysis isn't enough. But I'm struck by the the the, um, the lack of um, of discussion, not just in, not in so much this panel, but in general on the question of the effectiveness of various kinds of interventions. You know, we don't really. You know, so when the military decides they need to build another battleship or they want to put another jet 
they say, well, okay, we're going to do this, and we have to do this to deal with some fictitious enemy. On the other hand, here we've got real problems, and somehow if we were able to be more focused on what actually matters in terms of efficacy, then maybe we can put a bigger bet behind it and see whether, in fact, it, it, it uh, produces that result. Um, let me just end with, with, a, with a little anecdote here. Um, uh, I spent uh, what felt like a thousand years working in the World Bank, and then I finally escaped 15 years ago. And, and in, in, my, uh, in our classes here, we talk about, we, we talk, I, I used to talk a lot about projects. So at one point, um, we were talking about a an urban project in Dakar, in Senegal, that was started in 1972, that went along very slowly. The government declared it was a failure in 1982. The bank decided it was a failure. This was a sites and service project with, with infrastructure and housing. And so I'm mentioning this to students here, and finally a group of uh, women students, eight of them came to me and said, this was 2005, uh, we want to see what happened to that project. And they had read all the, the documentation about it, so they went, we sent them for eight weeks to live in Dakar and study this project. What they discovered was that this project, while it might have been declared a, a failure in 1982, had half a million people living in it in 2005, and it was one of the more desirable neighborhoods. And the question came up, why was this thing a failure in 82 and a roaring success you know, 25 years later? And how do you explain that? And then we began to ask the question, does anybody actually do long-term evaluation? So I went back to the Director General of the World Bank and I said, well, what do we do that? Do, does the bank do that? Well, no, we don't really look at things 30 years later. No. And I remember asking my colleague, Sakiko Fukudapar here, does she know of examples in the UN of really going and looking in the long term? I said, well, there's not that much of that either. And then somebody gave me a copy of the Dead Aid book by Dembisa Moyo. I said, well, how would she know that it was dead? Because nobody has looked at looked over over time. So it seems to me that not only do we need longitudinal studies, but we desperately need need sort of longer term evaluation to come to the question of efficacy to better understand the causation. And so one of the things we're actually trying to do in this school is get graduate students to get into the evaluation business, to go out and look and see what's happening. So it's a, I don't know, you know, somehow when we talk about that here, the students are encouraged and we try to mobilize them to do that. But it really has a link, it seems to me, with these policy questions. You know, we need a whole new generation of development research, impact research, and not just looking at the outputs of you know, whether the money was spent, we really need to look at outcomes as, as we're trying to do. So anyway, I, I really appreciate the, the meeting and, and uh, I want to congratulate uh, Equity for Children. Um, this is a little university with, uh, with global ambition in the sense that we're interested in big questions and, and we really would like to, uh, we think the questions are, are compelling and important and uh, this is kind of a perfect room to uh, discuss these things. You know, we have the wonderful murals of Orozco with the struggles of the, 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 Oxi the, the Orient here and the structural structures of the Occident here and, and just reminds us to, to be humble in front of all these things. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to all of you. Thank you to the panelists and to the presenters. And there is a wine that we want to share, it's outside, and we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much.